Uh, you may have missed it, but I just had to say I just had to do your intro twice. <laughs> oh no! Because you, you cut out. Try it again. Try it again. Try, there was start, a nice... start again. Start again. Start from the top again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Take two. Welcome. You are entering a strange realm. A realm of what ifs. What if movies, television shows, and video games were better, worse, bizarrer, or downright different? What might they look like? Find out on today's episode of Cinecasters! Hello, and welcome to Cinecasters, the show where we watch movies, analyze them, talk about them, and pitch alternate versions for how we would address the issues that we come up with in our analysis. I'm Nate Draper, and I'm joined, as always, by my very good friend, DeJangles. Yo, what's up? That was, like, the perfect intro. Like, that's, like, a summary of the show right there. If you could just oh. turn that, go go from, like, talk to text and be like, this is what our show is. This is what we do. We just talk oh, and occasionally awesome. laugh along the way is the only thing I would add. Okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll remember that for next time. Maybe we should just write that down, and then we can have that, like, on hand so that whoever is introducing the show could just read it's it. It's funny that you say that, because today the episode Megamind just aired, and in the, like, pre-episode bit, I was teasing Alyssa because she always forgets how to do the, the you know, the little intro, and I was like, do you want me to write you a script? And she was like, no. Maybe. <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe we should do that. But I don't know. I like the freeform style. Like, it's supposed to be a dialogue. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to lose that. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, if she needs a reference. Uh, she... <laughs> she does fine. She just needs to, uh, more confidence <laughs> in herself. But uh, speaking of confidence in yourself, this movie that we're doing today is all about a young sorcerer who doesn't have enough confidence in himself. Today we are looking at Willow, the uh, classic. I think it's nineteen ninety eight, right. directed by Ron Howard, starring uh, Warwick Davis. Yeah, nineteen eighty eight, um, not ninety eight. Did I say nineteen eighty eight? No, you said nineteen ninety eight. It's nineteen eighty eight. Uh, yeah, two eights. Yes, yeah. my mistake. Nineteen eighty eight. That is correct. Yeah. Um, it's the uh, movie about uh, yeah Warwick Davis. He lives in a village, and there's this kingdom. Uh, with this evil queen and there's a ba- there's a prophecy about a baby and he has to take this baby to away from his village and over the course of this adventure he meets other people and they work together to overthrow the evil queen yep it's um, a pretty basic story and and it, this movie is like cheesy as fuck but there's something really charming about it yeah oh yeah i i, I had fun watching it again. You, okay so you'd seen it before I'd seen it when I was a kid, okay. yeah, like years ago. Okay. This was my first time watching this movie, like ever. And uh, I gotta say, it was, it was it's an interesting movie. Like, like at first I thought it was just gonna be sort of this cheesy like fantasy movie that you know you get those those kind of movies that come out every couple of years where they're just like wizards and shit, and it's like trying to be epic, but really it just feels like someone's terrible Dungeons and Dragons campaign. This feels like someone's yes. awesome Dungeons and Dragons campaign, but it still feels cheesy. Yeah, yeah. Well, it has that sort of that uh, 80s charm to it. Yeah. It, it, is this movie like incredibly popular? Were a lot of people like interested in this movie? It is kind of, my understanding is it is like a semi-classic in the sense that it's a movie that some people will show to their kids because when they saw it when they were a kid and they thought it was fun when they were a kid. So it'd be, it would sort of, I guess, be on kind of like the same level as something like a never ending story. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it's like, it's where it's like, it's not great. It's not bad, but it's, you know, it's fun. You know, it's got some good wholesome family entertainment value, I guess, you know, people hacking at each other with swords and, you know, some good wholesome family yeah, entertainment um, that way. I- I I um I see this, I'm disappointed that I watched this like this time. I think this would have been an awesome movie to do with with the three of us, you me and Alyssa, because I think she would have oh, loved yeah. the pants off this movie. Um, oh, okay, so this is she she's into kind of the more fantasy. Well, she loves a fantasy, but I just also th- she just loves cheesy movies. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah. Whereas you and I tend to like do a we'll lot more sci-fi. Like time. she was just very yeah. You and I tend to do a lot more sci-fi. She and I 
tend to do like a lot of this big epic fantasy, but I thought this was going to be like a cheesy movie that like had some good ideas. I didn't think this was going to be a cheesy movie that was actually a good movie. So that's why I was like, oh, like you and I should do this one because I feel like you and I have, so you have were, a lot to talk about in terms of like structure of movie making and why it doesn't work. But you know what? I had a hard time pitching this movie because a lot of it works. I think it's just like my really only complaint with this movie is it's just too long. Interesting. Yeah, I I had a similar note. There were some other things about it. There yeah, were some, some specific small things. In, yeah, there's smallish nitpicks for me. Um, but I'm curious. So, wh- what were some of your? Uh, what were some of the things you thought worked, and what were some of the things you thought didn't work? Uh, I thought the whole idea of like this sorcerer sort of gaining confidence, and uh, and the fact that he's like just this sort of humble kind of character, Willow, who you know has to to take this um this baby who is the actual hero all the way you know across the kingdom in order to like save it and he becomes a hero along the way i was like that's that's a pretty that's a good story that's basically just lord of the rings except with a baby um yeah instead of a ring as because she's basically the alora is basically a MacGuffin, uh which is fine um but like he and he sort of grows into his own um I really, really liked that. I thought that was great. Um, there's some weird, like, body horror at at sometimes when he, like, uses the magic on the trolls and they, like, turn into... or get, like, twisted. And even when they turn into pigs, when the when um, the evil queen oh, turns yeah. into pigs, there's some, like, body horror shit. The practical effects are really, really well done, except for the claymation, but I kind of liked the claymation. Like, the monsters? Mm-hmm. I kind of liked it. Like, it looks ridiculous. But... I don't know. There's some weird things in here where I'm like, yo, these effects when they're turning into pigs look re- really scary and real. And yet this like two headed dragon mm-hmm. thing looks ridiculous. So I guess my biggest complaint that way would be consistency, like in terms of okay. effects. Uh, and then my only other really big complaint was, um, was the length of the movie. I felt like, Sometimes there's parts in the movie where I'm like, this is unnecessary. We're just sort of talking and doing something in front of, particularly when, when they meet Mad Mardigan and he's in the cage. That's uh, Val Kilmer's character. When he's in the cage, yep. all they do is like stand in front of him and continue to like talk, but nothing's happening. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah. So there's parts like that where I'm like, this could have been edited down to be shorter and there's like a really tight movie in here. That's my biggest, biggest complaint. The music is like super cheesy. It's uh, James Horner who did, did the Titanic. So like, it's awesome. There's this like flute thing whenever the fairy dust is involved. That's really evocative. Um, I think you can see the impact of this movie on like later fantasy movies, like including Harry Potter. I think you can actually like feel how much this movie has an impact on, on the world and feel of Harry Potter tonally. The first couple of Harry Potters, I mean, like one and two. And the last thing I would say is, is that really pissed me off was was um, how Val Kilmer, uh, Mad Mardigan, Val Kilmer's character, and Sorsha are sort of like shipped. I thought that was really badly done. Uh, what do you mean by shipped? Oh, I, that's like a colloquial term for like how they like wind up together, but are also like put together as like a romantic pairing. Right, like it's the it, the love potion kind of works in the beginning, but then they sort of like wind up together anyway. And her betrayal is like a complete turn of of character, simply because she's a woman and love, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know I, mean? I thought that was a little contrived. I thought it was very contrived, actually, and uh, didn't really help to advance the story either. Hmm, it's it's kind of a silly little thing. But I, which is disappointing because I actually think Sorsha's an interesting character that they don't do anything with. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, I, okay, so I'm gonna d- say something to the effects, the effect of the effects. Um, the I thought the I actually quite like the practical effects. Um, yes, mm-hmm, some of them mm-hmm. are cheesy. I was actually I actually got to see a um, like a, a like a kind of like a live Q and A. With Phil Tippett, there was a friend of mine who was able to basically get him on a Zoom meeting with a small group of us. Awesome. And so, so Phil Tippett 
is one of the guys who was the visual effects artists on this movie. And he actually talked a little, he talked very briefly about Willow and that scene with the two-headed dragon. Um, but uh, he's, he's a very iconic individual uh, in sort of the history of visual effects. Like he did the, I think he animated the Tauntaun in Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. Anyway, wow, that was just a bit of like, that was, a, that was just a cool like, moment for me to just brag about how I got to meet Phil Tippett online once. Um, but uh, things I liked about this movie were um, I thought the con- I thought the story was actually all overall like pretty good. Like it's a solid it's a it's an interesting world, interesting characters, interesting fantasy elements. Um, the, I thought some of the visuals, some of the some of the shots were quite stunning actually so like the landscapes and the way they had these these sort of like middle-aged era castles uh in the foreground or in the background i liked some of the artwork that way it is a fun movie it really is a fun movie um however i think (laughs) it's really offset it's really offset by some things that i think really bring it down yeah for starters the the two really tiny characters i think they're called oh, the brownies they're called the brownies movie. yeah they're like these like supposed to be like pixies or sprites and they just don't do anything i found them i agree exactly i found them a really annoying b not funny and c completely irrelevant like had n- they did not do anything so that to me like really dragged it down um uh, also, how many Wilhelm screams did you count? I counted three. <laughs> I like the Wilhelm scream. It never brings me out of oh, yeah. it. <laughs> I always find the the Wilhelm scream is like something something that is like fun to listen to. Like when you hear it, I'm like, oh, there it is. Like it never ruins a movie for me the way I know it does for some people. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't ruin it for me. I just that was just a fun thing. I at a yeah. certain point in the movie, I think I went. I was I started counting them, and I got up to three, which that's I was like, I think that's the movie. most. Yeah. Yeah. Usually you hear at least one, one, and it's always a fun little Easter egg. But yeah. when you're like three, were they like really <laughs> stretching it on their sound effects yeah. library? They probably. Anyway, yeah, they probably that's not really the screams. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that is a negative. For I, I kind of I. I kind of enjoyed it, but that's just a fun thing I noticed. noticed. Um, okay, other things that I thought really dragged it down. We talked about this, the love story. Yeah. I felt it, I felt it was really contrived and, and really unnecessary. Yeah. Like, it just really didn't... It didn't do anything. Um, I did feel like some of the relationships, not just the love story, but just between the characters and how they relate and how that developed, some of that it was either too easy or too complicated like i felt that scene with uh where val kilmer's character is in the cage and all the other characters are trying to figure out whether he's like safe or not i I thought the concept of the scene was pretty good but i somehow felt basically one of the things that i felt like was happening a lot in the movie is it was basically characters were kind of just screaming at each other um (laughs) without really working towards any kind of solution yeah and the solution would just kind of come about like either through some, you know, act of heroism or I don't know, magic. they just now they have to but go not, somewhere. Not else. magic like sorcerer magic, like not fantasy magic, magic like plot magic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good way to put it. Um, so specifically, like, there's there's a few scenes where he's like, Mad Mort again, we got to go over here. Oh, man. Like, I feel like that was, you could do a nice little mixtape. Of every time where he you just remix. says Mad, Mad Mart again. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that just, I just felt like sometimes it... W- it wasn't really adding anything. It was just them screaming at each other. There wasn't really anything being discussed beyond, oh, I'm frustrated. Yeah. And and I'm going to yell at you. Uh, and then that goes to my, my kind of my final criticism is I just, it's got really bad dialogue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't think dialogue is like the be all and end all of movies. I know a lot of people will sort of go like, oh, wow, they write such great dialogue. Oh, the dialogue was terrible. And they sort of use that as, as a way to, you know, just to value the entire, uh, you know, how good the movie is. I think good dialogue think it, is noticeable and bad dialogue is noticeable. But like most of the time, I'm not really paying attention to how dialogue is written so much as how it's delivered. Yeah. Yeah. 
Like it's it, it's less important to me, I guess, how well or how. I mean, I want it to be believable, but it's not super important if your dialogue isn't perfect. Like you don't have to be like Sorkin levels of of amazing dialogue. It's fine to just have a normal character. Also, Sorkin's characters are are often like really pretentious, which is fine because it works for how he writes, but they're often like super over the top. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Another director writer who does that is uh, Wes Anderson. Like his, yeah. a lot of his dialogue is over the top pretentious for the effect of his, a lot of his characters are very vain. So yeah. it's, it's sort of the joke about the vanity of all these characters. Um, at least that's how I've always interpreted it. Yeah. And I agree. Like dial- dialogue is not the be all and end all, but I- in certain cases, you just go, that, like, really? That's, uh, that's, that's not how that's people what talk. They came up yeah. with. Yeah, exactly. Or like that's just not not conducive to how a plot works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think for me, it just it came down to a lot of just it felt like recycled dialogue. Mm-hmm. Now I don't know how much of that is because later movies would essentially steal from this one, or how much this was stealing from other movies. But it just felt like, oh, okay, I've heard this exact conversation in every other fantasy movie spoken exactly the same way. I wonder, I actually think that's probably this influence on other movies. Because cause while watching this movie, you're were you were right, like it did feel samesy. But I wonder if that's like because the tone and feel of this movie influenced so many other fantasy movies since. It's possible. I'm, I'm willing to accept that as a possibility. But I feel like there's other, like you see it... I know it's like George Lucas produced it, but there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities that way to Star Wars. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. Uh, I can't think of any, so maybe it is. <laughs> I can't think of maybe any. Maybe so it whatever. is. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I really did like that I want to bring up is um, there's. Uh, the, the idea of, like, what we might call ableism or racism uh, or however, you know, little people want to be addressed. But this idea that, like, we can have actual, you know, little people actors and then and then kind of have them b- talked about uh, in a racist way. Like, they continue to use this, like, in-world derogatory term, peck. And... Mm-hmm. and um, but have it turn out that you know he's the hero, and we sort of see this with with the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbits. But but I like that they used little people as the actors. The hero of our story is Willow, and Willow himself is not a uh, conventional hero. But also he's played by, and the entire town of the Nelwyn people are played by little people, um, which I think does a lot of. I mean, they they little people do a lot of work in movies for lots of various reasons but i just think like having them be heroes without any prosthetics or anything like that i think that's just important and i i think that that makes this movie kind of on another level from a lot of other fantasy movies you know mm-hmm. i and i agree however the movie kind of shoots itself in the foot because when it was first released uh he, warwick davis was not the top build even though he's technically the leading character, he was like the third build, which is dumb. Member of the cast, yeah. Now, which is nowadays yeah. they would have done something like, uh, like featuring Val Kilmer and what's her face and introducing. I can't remember the woman who plays Sorsha, and then they would have been like, and also, or and and starring like in in his feature debut, Warwick Davis. Mm-hmm. But I get it, like. I mean, even back, even today, people are still dicks, right? Audiences are still dicks. They're yeah. going to be like, well, am I going to go see a movie where the the lead actor is some nobody little person who I've never heard about? Regardless of what, how good the movie is or isn't, the people are just assholes. Mm-hmm. Whereas Val Kilmer was a big name back in the day. Although, what has Val Kilmer done recently? Yeah, actually, yeah, actually, I was thinking about that when I was watching it. I was like, yeah, what? <laughs> He's... He's uh, you don't you don't see his name like you know appearing front and foremost on uh, like any Anything. movies and yet yeah. at, at a time he seemed like he was one of the stars. Um, Where versus so, yeah. everybody knows who Warwick Davis is. He's in movies all the time, mm-hmm. and, and, and you just you just may not see him because he's like covered in layers of makeup. Yeah, layers uh, ma- layers of makeup or prosthetics or whatever. But like, 
you know, he's he, and Peter Dinklage as well. Like they've done a lot of of good work in terms of publicity for little people, but also, and I want to make this very clear, also they're just good actors regardless of the fact that they're little people. Mm, well, especially Peter Dinklage, yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, you know, he's, I mean, anyone who's seen Game of Thrones would know that uh, his performance is really one of the but, captivating, more captivating, well, I mean, they're all great performances, yeah. but his character is is really iconic. And he's a fan favorite. Oh, yeah, and rightly so. I mean, his, his he's also just got some of the best lines in the series. Yeah. So, good writing and good acting go go well yeah. together. Um, but, like, you know, every, people are familiar with, with Warwick Davis's work, especially in, as... Um, uh, Professor Flitwick. Mm, right. Uh, so even in just background or, and, and he does lots of other stuff with lots of other, um, lots of other actors. And I think he's just, I think it's just good. It's just good work, man. Like he's, mm-hmm. he's in lots of things. Whereas I don't know what Val Kilmer is in. So it's disappointing that the movie does shoot itself in the foot. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, cause like Warwick Davis really is like a legendary figure to me, at least in film history. Cause just, just like the sheer catalog of movies that he's been a part yeah. of. He's, uh, he's been a very significant presence in the world of cinema. I would say yeah. it'd be interesting to have this movie redone or even to just get a sequel. They are doing a sequel series, Ooh, I believe. Okay, that would be interesting. Uh, uh, but I would really hope that Warwick Davis would would, would return to the role because I do feel yeah. like there's there's something about this world and there's something about this movie that is that we've talked about. It's super charming. I I want um I kind of want to go back to it, but I want it handled maybe with a bit more care. And I also would mm-hmm. like. You know, as you just said, I would also like Warwick Davis to get sort of the appreciation for all the shit he's done. And then he gets his own movie where he's the main character and they still fuck him over. Yeah. I know. I, I was sort of shocked when I read that. Now, that was that was an IMDb. It was like an IMDb. It was on the IMDb like page the for it. Or so. just the billing. Uh, it was it was a th- it was a thing called like crazy like another thing yeah. that was specific to credits and it made note of that so um, so it was worth worth making a note of at least yeah exactly yeah it's actually under a, if it goes under did you know and then it's called it says crazy credits mm. and there it goes even though he played the title role Warwick Davis just took third billing Val Kilmer and Joanne Wally Joanne Wally w- w- yeah. Whaley yeah yeah took first and second billing respectively. Which is hilarious because I think Joanne Whaley, who plays Sorsha, is uh has like less lines than her mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quite possibly. Yeah. I mean probably it's certainly less than other characters in the movie. Like I think um the the, the like the two, oh, the two smaller guys the two brownies, Kevin Pollack. Yeah. yeah, I think they even have more lines than her. Yeah ridiculous ridiculous uh was there anything that you really really didn't like like apart for me it was the whole sorsha thing like it's like this character is useless like honestly you could have had sorsha and and the general kale i think his name was something like that the general character that works under bav morda the evil queen those two characters could have been one character uh yes i i agree um and they could have either been her daughter like it could have stayed as sorcia or it could have been the general but either way it felt to me like we have two characters that are not useful yeah i agree um i feel like she kind of just existed to, for the sake of introducing some kind of a love story mm-hmm. and that that in and of itself had nothing really had no bearing on the uh, like other events outside of it yeah um i guess the idea was they were trying to show there's a they're trying to give more of a reason for val kilmer to change and i mean and what other reason would there you know a hardened criminal slash is he a criminal vigilante? like i don't know he just seems i don't to know be a yeah it's true more than anything he's sort of modeled he's kind of like the the han solo like you know heart of gold lone ranger yeah. kind of yeah like i'm off on my own you know that sort of archetype mm-hmm. but 
I guess, you know, they needed some needed to find some further justification for him to change and oh well he has to fall in love because that's the that makes sense is the only reason <laughs> somebody why would change, he yeah. would change his position. Is to fall in love. I, I also think um I, I do think it's interesting that Willow himself as a character uh is already married and has children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like for for um usually your main character doesn't have that you know what I mean? Like there's the the whole going out to find adventure, even if they're the reluctant hero, love is sort of usually something that's in the cards for your character. But but Willow already has uh, a family, and so leaving is is a very different journey for him than it is for for Mad Mardigan. Because in a lot of ways, Mad Mardigan should be our hero, and the fact that he gets top billing kind of fucks with this. But Willow is the hero; he's our main character, he's our protagonist. Whereas Mad Mardigan should be our our you know prototypical hero and that's why i think this movie is really really interesting nothing about willow sort of screams hero until he has to be yeah yeah i um well interesting on that actually that's a good point um because i think that is an interest that is that is something that does make the sort of the starting point unique one of the thing i do think is a bit of a uh bit of a weaker point in this story is how it goes from uh him him going back to his home village um it's certainly like now he's able to become a, a sorcerer but there doesn't seem i felt like in stories like this where there's a character who goes off to solve something and then comes back usually in those cases and I'm modeling this sort of off the Joseph Campbell model of storytelling, but usually whatever experience they've had, they bring that back with them and they're able to then help. It's the boon they bring back to their village and then that helps their, yeah. their village with whatever problem it was facing before. And I kind of feel like there was, he shows up and things are just fine. I wonder if there's like an edited or a cut scene where he comes back and uses his magic to help him plant because he's been gone for so long. Right. And he talks yeah. About, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it wouldn't really help the village, but it would help his home. So it sort mm-hmm. of brings this knowledge back and uses his magic to help him plant his seeds on his farm so he can help his family. That mm-hmm. would make more sense to me. See, my problem was with the beginning was um, uh, I think we almost should have started right away with who with just Willow and his family. And then they find mm-hmm. the baby. I agree. And then it's like, who the fuck yes. is, what the fuck is this baby? And then when he takes it to like the Nelwyn wizard, like the, the wizard can be like, oh, this is the prophecy. This child isn't just a regular child, it's this child. And that's why the dogs came looking for it. And so we can sort of, you know, because the Nelwins are separate from the uh, quote unquote human, um, regular humans. I hate to use that word, but I can't remember. Daikini, I think is the word they use. Uh, I think yeah. so, yeah. The, the Nelwins are sort of separate from the Daikini uh, people, and so we can get this sort of prophecy about the Daikini, and, and the Nelwins wouldn't really know about it, so we as the audience are learning this while Willow is learning about it, instead of getting this whole prophecy thing at the beginning and watching the baby get thrown downstream, we can just be like, boom, we're with Willow, finds the baby, doesn't know what to do with the baby, doesn't really want the baby, becomes the reluctant hero, goes on this quest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree, because then you're discovering the world with your main character yeah. as well. Yeah, exactly. And I, I just think, and then immediately you don't really have to explain like, oh, the Nelwyn are different people than the Daikini because you can just go, yeah, they visually look different. These are sort of this world's version of elf folk or dwarf folk, except they have their own word because it's its own world. Great. Cool. I can see visually that they're different. And then when humans show up and we can clearly see that this, this baby is Daikini, it's not the same uh, it doesn't look the same as, as the Nelwyn people. So we sort of get that differentiation there and we can experience racism the sort of the same way that we're already seeing the movie, the way they talk about Willow and Willow's people. And then finally, I don't know. I think that's, that's more interesting to discover the world that way. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I find prophecy oftentimes fantasy movies sort of rely too much on this kind of prologue. Um, Sometimes it can be really interesting, like the Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring gives you one. Um, but that's, I think that's a bit more central to the story because there's so many details mm. to, to be able to, like, you need to know what the significance of the ring is. But Fellowship um, also does it pretty quickly. It's true. It gets, it gets through it pretty it quickly. Does it, it, yeah. it does it in poem. 
mm-hmm. and it gets through it pretty quickly. It just gives us the poem, the nine rings, and then the one ring to rule them all, and then poof, you're right into the the Shire. I still think the Shire mm-hmm. takes maybe a little too long, but we don't get the full backstory of the ring and how it was forged and what happened to it. Like that was that's all kind of done pretty quickly. But the backstory of the ring isn't done until the two towers when we start to get Golem's backstory. Oh yeah, I know that's Return of the King at the beginning. But you actually do get the you do get the whole um, the battle of Pelham, oh, Pelham man. Fields. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, you get you get in the prologue in Fellowship of the Ring, you get how they they went into Mordor to fight Sauron, and then Isildur chopped off Sauron's finger, took the ring. You do get you do get that, mm. but yeah, the the whole go- uh, Golem story doesn't come up till Return of the King. But yes, you're right. Like there's there's little bits of it. You don't get the full like here's how it ended up. Like you don't get the Hobbit and everything. You know, you do it go it progresses through it pretty quickly. Um, but uh, even then, you know, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting yeah. to think of, you know, w- watching it without any sort of prologue. If you just started with Frodo, and then you sort of f- figure it out with him, you discover yeah, discover this because Frodo doesn't know anything about this ring. Mm-hmm. Now he just knows it's like a special ring Bilbo has. But you know, and then and then we see Bilbo put it on and he turns invisible. We go, oh, okay, that's weird. That's what's wild. what's yeah, that what about? That? And, and then, then Gandalf then... comes up, be like, oh, yo, this is uh, this is some bad shit here. This ring, we got to throw it in the volcano, and you got to do it, Frodo. And Frodo's like, why, why the hell I got to do this? Yeah, and then and then we so, can explain. Yeah, you just have to be yeah. careful. You're not doing an exposition dump, but you know what? The whole prologue is basically an exposition dump. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Should we get into some pitches? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, how are you feeling about your pitch? I feel pretty good about mine. I'm, actually, I'm, I at first wasn't feeling good about mine, and then I think I turned it around. Okay. So I don't know. Cool. Uh, do you want to go first, or you want to go second? Um. Uh, why don't you go okay, first? I'll go first. So I actually, uh, my biggest problem with, with this movie was sort of like the handling of Sorsha. So I was like, I, I want to focus on her. So mine accidentally became like a young adult fiction story that focuses oh, around nice. Sorsha as the main character. Oh, awesome. So um, so my movie opens up and we've seen that there's a grand castle that rules over the land. And it appears to be like everywhere appears to be pretty prosperous in the last 20 years or so. The kingdom has been run by the queen Bavmorda and the people or Bavmordia, whatever it is. The people in the town and surrounding area are pretty pleased with what she's done. And they have amount, they basically amassed amount, a uh, good amount of wealth and prosperity during her time. So, um, uh, Bavmorda has a child who's young who falls very, very sick and is frail. And Bavmorda is afraid to lose her. So one day the witch, um, Rizel comes to the castle and tells like the there's going to be a child of great power who will come become empress and bring the land into even greater prosperity. And Babmordia is uneasy about this, but she you know has to spend her time looking after her sickly child. So she's worried about you know this 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 child of prophecy coming into the world and taking her throne from her. So she begins having every pregnant woman brought to the castle uh, to check for their child. And, and people are like, you know, every so often one of those children doesn't come back, even though the pregnant woman is gives birth at the castle. Oh. So after years, Sorsha is now grown up. She's healthy and strong now after being looked after. She's probably about 17. <clears throat> and her mother's let her do things that she she wants to do because she's just happy that Sorsha is happy and strong. So she's allowed to become like a member of the guard and learn to fight and whatnot because her mother is just like, I'm so glad you aren't sick anymore. You're nice and strong. So yeah, you can do whatever you want as long as you keep up with your academics. So Sorsha is allowed to like, when she turns 17, is basically allowed to, to start rounding up these pregnant women. Uh, and once they give birth, they're brought back to their village. Um, so once Babmorda allows Sorsha the ability to go outside the kingdom, the territory beyond where they've also been rounding up people, um, Sorsha is like, on the outskirts she's like whoa these villages are messed up this is outside of my mother's kingdom so it's outside of her influence so these people don't have the same kind of prosperity they're you know they're just subsistence farmers there's no law like these people are angry at the world and and just the land is 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 much more harsh and she's like this is this is why people we have to stop this uh this uh, child of prophecy from coming along we have to make sure that we can, you know, expand my mother's influence and look after these people. Um, so, yeah. 
Uh, so while returning to the castle after dropping off some of these women, Sorsha gets word that a woman has given birth and evaded the roundup and the baby was never checked. So Sorsha ch chases after the midwife the same way that happens in the original movie, puts the child in the stream and then Willow finds it. And Sorsha's like chasing after the child. And so she loses the child down the stream and she deduces that the child must be in the Nelwyn village. Um, so she's like, okay. okay, here we go. I'm going to enter the village pretending to be a young woman rather than the princess. And I'll pretend to be lost in the woods. And the Nelwyn seem to tolerate Sorsha, but they really want her gone. So it's sort of a festival's going on and they're like, well, we'll figure out what to do with you. But it's weird to have a daikini here. So she sees Willow perform some magic tricks and is suitably impressed. And he claims to be that he wants to be a sorcerer. Um, but she, what she also notices is that the, although the Nelwyn are farmers, they seem to have their own kind of prosperity, even though they're outside of her mother's influence. So she's like, hmm, that's a little weird. She's far, far away from, from home now. So a town council is called over what to do with Sorsha because she can't leave until the morning, but nobody volunteers to like look after her. So the old Nelwyn wizard rolls his bones, which is bullshit. And he basically says that, <laughs> which is basically says that Willow should be the one to look after the girl. And Willow, of course, okay. doesn't want to. And we know the reason because he found the baby. Like mm -hmm. the audience knows, but nobody else knows. So he's like, no, I can't do it. And they're like, well, you have that barn. That barn will be big enough to hold a daikini, a young daikini woman. And she's like, uh, yeah, sure, fine. Before uh, Sorsha leaves with, with uh, Willow, the Nilwyn wizard basically talks to her. He pulls her to the side and says, like, I know who you are. And I know that you have to come to terms with the things that your mother has done. So that's why I like the bones were bullshit. And I knew that you had to go to Willow because I know what Willow has. And Sorsha's oh. like, what? How can he know so much? So Sorsha goes to Willow's farm and offers to help him plant. She's still under the prete pretense of like, you know, trying to be this helpless little girl lost. And she actually like helps him plant. And between the two of them, they get a lot done. And he's like very grateful. Uh, and they're trying to hide the baby from Sorsha. So in the night, she's sleeping in the barn and she hears the child cry and she goes to take the child. Uh, but Willow, even though he's an amateur wizard and doesn't know much about magic, still stands and defends the baby, even though it's not his. And she's like, you don't even know who this baby is. Like, it's not even yours. It's a Daikini, not a Nelwyn. And he's like, this doesn't matter. She's just a baby. And he uses magic and accidentally turns Sorsha into a bird. Uh, and he's like, okay. crap, I was going for a toad. <laughs> <laughs> but now she's a bird so willow's not stupid and so he takes sorsha and the baby sorsha can talk as a bird to the nelwyn elder who basically tells him that willow is in possession of a child that will become the empress right and he okay. and he basically must take the child to tear aslan uh where where she can like realize the truth and and uh become uh uh the empress and take down Babmorda. So Willow goes on this quest and he leaves the town by himself, but he takes Sorsha, who's still in bird form with him because he's like, I made you this way. So I'm responsible for what happens to you. You know, somebody who can't protect themselves, even if it's a child or a bird and it's not your family, you still have to look after them because it's the right thing to do. And I made you this way. And Sorsha is sort of like blown away by his like way of thinking. It's not the way she was raised. Mm -hmm. So here we can have Willow and Sorsha go through some hijinks like in the fairy forest and you know maybe some soldiers and I wouldn't I wouldn't make it the focus but I think it would be interesting if like uh Sorsha saw um like other soldiers for the first time and was like oh so this is what like men are like but the point is not to have a love story I just think that would be an interesting point of growth in her in her mm -hmm. journey uh but they get to the fairy forest and here like the great fairy tells her that the child of prophecy will have a, a mark on her arm uh, of a symbol that means great power. And so Willow looks and sees that the baby who's who he names Alora has a birthmark on her arm. And so he's like, it's so it's all coming to fruition. This is happening. We have to get her to uh, what the to tear Aslan. So meanwhile, Sorsha, as they go through these hij hijinks, Sorsha as a bird seems to be getting sick. And Willow thinks it's because she's stuck as a bird and he tries to like turn her back. But because the magic is based on, like, his own conviction and he's not very confident, it's not working. But also because he thinks that if she turns back into human, she'll actually overpower him and take Elora. And so the magic doesn't uh. isn't really working because he's of two minds. Um, 
But Sorsha is kind of growing fond of Alora and Willa, like traveling with them. Um, she's getting to know like more of them, and uh, as a bird form, she actually like helps look after them and try and find their way to Tyr Aslan. Um, and during one time when she tries to defend uh, Laura from being taken, her wing gets injured and scarred. Uh, and so she can't fly anymore. So now she's even more helpless. But Willow looks after her. So once they reach Tyr Aslan, they find it empty and kind of nasty and barren. And all the land is sort of like almost plagued. And here it turns out that Bab Morda has laid a trap for Willow and the baby, not knowing that her daughter was with them as a bird. And it turns out, Bab Morda explains that she had brought prosperity to her kingdom by basically stealing the nutrients and life from the surrounding land. And so what Sorsha thought was her mother making the world a better place through her influence was actually her just stealing the prosperity from other lands using black magic. Oh. And that's why like the farm farmers are angry with each right. other because there's not enough food to go around because their land is basically suffering. Um. Hmm. So with her army, Babmorda easily takes the baby, leaves Willow to dies, and of course doesn't recognize her own daughter as a bird. In a last-ditch effort, Willow performs the spell to taint change Sorsha um, because he really, really needs her and needs her to be human, and it works because of his conviction, and she turns back into her old self, but her wing, or sorry, what was her wing is now her arm, and it's injured, like still horribly injured, hmm. uh, and she's also sick, so she's not really able to, to catch up with the army. Um, and even though she's human again, Willow doesn't, or uh, Sorsha doesn't seem to be getting any better. She's still getting sicker and sicker. So Willow takes Sorsha to the witch from the beginning, Roselle, and asks her to help. And Roselle says that, that this is dark magic. And when Sorsha was young Bab and ill and weak, Babmorda actually heard of the prophecy of the child that would take the throne and thought she could fix two problems with one stone. So she's been sacrificing the occasional child, if it might be the child of prophecy, to keep her daughter healthy. <laughs> so all the babies that, bore, that Bavmorda did not bring back to their mothers every so often have actually mm -hmm. been used to keep Sorsha healthy. And that oh, wow. because she hasn't done it so recently, because they think they found the actual child of prophecy in Alora, um, Sorsha has been getting sick. But if they can pr sacrifice Elora as she, they think she is actually the real child of prophecy, then Sorsha would probably be healthy forever. So Sorsha is learning from Willow, is basically disgusted by this action. Like, she's like, oh my god, like, you're supposed to have care and respect. That's what Willow taught me. And, like, even if it's not family, you can't just, like, do this. So even though I might die, I still think we should save Elora. It's the right thing to do. So mm -hmm. showing that kind of growth that she's learned from Willow. Um, so even though she's unwell and this will probably kill her, they like go after it. So Sorsha and Willow head to the castle and on their way, they pull together an army of like all the people they've met along the way. So we can have like the fairies and some soldiers and stuff like that. And through all the battling and, and getting together, Sorsha is getting sicker and her, but her arm is healing and she knows that she is going to have to stop her mother, even if she's sick. So she and Willow eventually make it to her mother's chamber. And Willow uses magic to combat Bavmorda because he now has more confidence. He's still not a great sorcerer. Uh, but Sorsha goes and grabs the baby. But Bavmorda easily overpowers Willow and attacks Sorsha with magic. But because uh, Sorsha is holding the baby, it doesn't work on her. There's no The uh, magic doesn't affect her. Right. And the baby seems to be perfect, protecting Sorsha. So she continues to try to escape, but her strength is failing because of her health. And Bavmorda is basically devastated now that her daughter would fight against her. And even even go so far as to like put her, make herself sick by not sacrificing a child to live, um, and Sorsha's like I don't understand how you could watch other mothers suffer because their child is dead, because that's the thing you're trying to avoid by making them suffer. You're literally causing other mm -hmm. people to feel what you're trying to avoid feeling. And if you know that kind of anguish, why would you do that to other people? And while Sorsha is talking, she basically passes. Elora, the baby, off to uh, Willow so he can get it out of there. And uh, and then while, while Willow is, like, running away with the baby, uh, Babmorda uses magic to basically strike Sorsha down, but it doesn't work, even though Sorsha is not holding the baby. And Willow puts the pieces together because he sees Sorsha standing in front of him, and because when she was a bird, her arm was injured and healed, as a human, she now has a scar on her arm, as a, and it's the, in the symbol of great power. 
And the prophecy said that there would be a child. Uh, Not that the child would be born. It just said a child of prophecy. Not a child that would be born. And so... And she has the mark. And so, um, and Sorsha, although she is a young woman, is technically 17 and still a child. And so she defeats Bab Morda by pushing her mother off the tower. Oh. So with the dark magic gone, and all of the dark, ma- from Bab Morda, all of the dark magic in her body is also gone. And so Sorsha now has to fight off the sickness for herself. And so I'm torn here. I'm torn here between whether, um, whether... Sorsha should die here or whether she should recover but either way while she's sick Willow would basically say like you know you you did all this to protect uh Alora even though she's just a regular baby and Sorsha's like no that makes her she's not just a regular baby that makes her just as important as every other living thing because she's a baby just like you know everyone prophecy or not we still have to look after those who are less capable just like you taught me and that that makes us Elora just as important as any other living thing. But I'm torn as to whether Ooh. Sorsha should die or whether she should recover now that all the black magic is out of her body. But I don't know. What do you think? It's a family movie. She should live. Okay, so she lives. I just thinking because the yeah. dark magic was is what was keeping her alive, technically. So, I don't know. It's okay. I, I, I did something similar in mine. I got to the end and was like, you know what? It's a it's a family-friendly movie. Kids are going to watch this. I'll give it a happy ending. Why not? Okay, well, fine. So, Sorsha, even though it looks like she's going to die, does manage to pull through in the end because people who... Hey, we'll do it this way. We'll make it. She does manage to pull through in the end because people who aren't her family still look after her and help her get help. There you go. Because everybody matters. And that's what matters. Yeah. Everybody. Oh. Everybody matters. There you go. So yeah. even if they're not your family, they still matter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually quite fond of that pitch. Yeah. No, it was good. I liked I liked the direction you went with it. Um, and making Source the main character. That was pretty interesting. I also thought it was great. Both, so both, both of us basically effectively um, removed Val Kilmer. <laughs> from our versions of willow the only problem with my version of willow is i don't think it would be called willow sorsha i don't know what i would call it but i mean willow's in it but he sort of acts what i like about mine is like willow is the sort of like old wizard archetype Mm -hmm. but he himself has to like learn stuff so he's like this right this unwilling unwilling hero so even though sorsha is the main character Willow is this like, no, we need to look after this thing, but he's not a very confident wizard. He sort of has to learn things of his own, Mm -hmm. Um, which is cool. He becomes this like, he becomes a character in his own right, but is also an archetype to Sorsha. I don't know. Right. You know how like Gandalf, go on. I was going to say like, I was just about to say Gandalf has like his own, he's the wizard archetype, but there's this idea that the wizard archetype doesn't change, but that, like, in Lord of the Rings, Gandalf has an arc as well. Yeah, Gandalf, I don't really like Gandalf's sort of. arc, because he basically just goes from being Gandalf the awesome to being Gandalf the more awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Fair. Whereas, like, That's true. in my yeah. Willow, it's it's not Willow's um, awesomeness that makes him uh, Sorsha's guide, it's his compassion and empathy. Right. That sort of makes him the that kind of like um I don't know, father figure archetype. I don't know what the archetype is, but that that sort of like mentor archetype, it's his compassion. Right. Whereas he still has his own arc in terms of confidence. And he could learn that maybe from Sorsha, who is very confident. So yeah. we have this Actually, sort of mutual. Yeah. 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 I'm just thinking of even like the wizard archetypes from sort of the books I read growing up. You have Dumbledore and Gandalf, who are both really, when you think about it, just very highly manipulative. Oh, yeah. They are not cool people. Dumbledore especially is... is People are always like, Dumbledore is the greatest. And I'm like, not really, actually. Like, he's... he's. I mean, he's very conflicted, really. I mean, that becomes clear well, that's one in of the later interesting, books. That's one of the interesting things about Dumbledore is, is in, in book seven, it becomes very clear that Dumbledore was trying to do all the right things through all the worst ways. And it, and he he owns that. By the end of the the seventh book, we realize like, hang on, this is a very conflicted character who knew that he was doing bad things sometimes. Hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Versus and and even Gandalf to some extent, he's effectively leading Frodo to his death. And I think he knows it too. And he does. Oh, he absolutely knows it. Yeah. 
Well, I want to hear your pitch. Okay. Um, so mine uh, is actually pretty close to the movie. Um, but it starts off with Willow in his village. And a uh, baby comes along and we're going, oh, okay, what's this baby doing in a basket in this village? And in my version, um, there's basically, it's, uh, what it was sort of alluded to in the original was there's some guy who's trying to I didn't I didn't quite I'm not sure I understood it. Is this guy trying to like take his farm? Oh, uh, you're talking or, about the, the the sort of like village leader not the Nelwyn elder, yeah. but like the village leader Yeah, I think he just wants the land Yeah, okay. Well, Bra- um, his name's like in, Bradle cut or something like that. Okay, maybe I got the names mixed up, but um, so that character um, He that's that sounds right he basically Willow Will it's Willow's brother, and Willow's brother is basically um, he's sort of the one who calls the shots, but he's he's a bit of a bully, and what he's doing is he's basically buying up farms around the village, and he's essentially dictating how it's supposed to go, and Willow Willow thinks this is wrong, but he's not sure. This is his brother. He's not entirely sure how to confront his brother on it. Um, anyway, from that point on, it's more or less the same. Like, he's still trying to become a sorcerer. They get the baby. They say, okay, you have to go on this mission. But in my version, it's just him and uh, and his friend, whose name is... I can't remember. Migosh. Migosh. So yeah, it's Migosh. Willow, Willow, Willow and Migosh are sent, and they get lost. And in my version, instead of meeting Val Kilmer, it's Sorsha. And Sorsha is actually in one of those cages. And they're trying to figure out, like, basically, like, she's, she's asking for water. But they're like, well, can we trust her? Like, they give her water, but she's basically like, like, I, can you let me out of this cage? Like, can you let me out of here? And they're going, like, what if she, like, what if she, like kills us and like takes all our food and she's like i'm not going to do that and so there's a bit of a back and forth where it's a like trying to negotiate in the end basically what sorsha tells them is she says she knows of a small she's basically like look i know of a small village i can help you get there and i'm sure that there's someone there who will look after this baby you have um my next line i wrote as they journey along shenanigans i don't know what that yeah be, i was the same way that when i said the the like they where they would like meet a soldier and go to the fairy forest i was just like they need hijinks like i'm not really certain what that would look like but you need some kind of fantasy hijinks where your characters grow together yeah exactly uh, but uh, basically i said shenanigans they hide they sneak through armies they get to the village but they see that it's being completely destroyed and but there's still some like lingering soldiers there and Sorsha has to fight them off. And as she fights them off, one of them recognizes her and calls her a traitor. Um, so, but that's it. Anyway, so, uh, is somewhere in the scene here, Willow is like looking after Alora, uh, and this is when Sorsha sees the birthmark. And here she goes, okay, well, maybe if this village wasn't burned, I know of an island that's inhabited by a sorcerer named Raziel. Um, maybe we can take her there and maybe she'll help us. They go to this island, they find Raziel, and they find that she's being turned into a a raven. Um, And she did so because she was experimenting with dark magic because she thought that's how, that was how to defeat Bev Morda. Um, But she's able to, if Willow can transform her back into her original form, then... Um, then she'll be able to. Then she'll be able to help them. But unfortunately, Willow is unable to transform her. Um, he's just. He's just not able to do it. So uh, Raziel says that, like, don't worry about it. Like for now, let's just try to get to Tereslin, and when we get there, like this baby will be protected. And however, Sorsha is reluctant to go. She's like, I don't really want to go to Tereslin, but they convince her that. Like, she's going to be the only one who can really protect them. So she goes along with them. However, when they get to Tyr Esleen, they find that it's been completely deserted, uh, just more or less destroyed, and all the people who live there are, in, are trapped in the crystal, mm-hmm. like, like we saw in the original. Yeah. However, in this one, Raziel says, like, she can actually free everyone with her, but she has to be turned in, back into a, 
a human before she can use her magic to free everyone. So Willow tries again, but he's not able to do so. And it's at this point that they're ambushed and Alora is taken and Sorsha managed to like survive, Willow survived, but Alora's been taken. And it's at this point that Sorsha actually reveals who she is and she's actually and that she is the queen's daughter. Dun, and, dun, dun. and she what happened was as her mother was sort of descending more and more into this like obsession basically she tells she then tells the story of it's kind of like it becomes like a long flashback but it's like a macbeth narrative where the it starts off where the queen is like no my mother was really good to me but then she heard this prophecy and she became obsessed and it became this it became this like self-fulfilling prophecy where she was became so afraid and she started doing all these evil things and I tried to call her out on it but she wouldn't listen to me and finally she uh, like she asked me to like go up to this village and and find all the pregnant women and I refused so she put me in the dungeon and I escaped and I decided I wanted nothing to do with my mother so I was running through the wilderness um, trying to survive and I found myself in this like other kingdom and I was stealing like they caught me stealing to survive and that's how I ended up in that cage where you found me um, uh, but basically she tells this whole story and then she goes like her final line is like sometimes the people who are like the hardest the the people who are the hardest to challenge are the ones that you love the most mm-hmm. um, relating to Willow's whole thing with his brother at the beginning yeah, of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here Willow tries again to turn Raziel into a human, and he's successful this time. And this time she turns into a human, she frees everyone uh, from the crystals, and now they have, like, basically it's all the people of Tirezlin who've now basically been freed from crystals, and they're able to help Sorsha. However, they recognize Sorsha. Uh, and reason Sorsha was reluctant to go to Tiras Lean to begin with was, was because she was one of the people who was one of the leaders in destroying oh, Tiras yeah. years ago. So now Sorsha is trying to help them coordinate an attack back on on her mother's palace, but they're like, "No, we don't want anything to do with you. You like, you you came here, destroyed our castle, and now we're all we, we were imprisoned in these crystals." because of you but Raziel and Willow are basically able to convince them like no 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 like she's different now she's changed and together they come up with a plan and Sorsha basically she's like I escaped I know a way back in um but it's heavily guarded and I know that a lot of those guards that if they're called up for service to defend the castle that passage will be opened so they basically agree they're going to create a distraction outside so Sorsha, Willa and Raziel can can sneak in and so they sneak in and um, Raziel's going to do battle with Bavmorda but she's not able to, to defeat Bavmorda so then it becomes a showdown between Bavmorda and Sorsha and basically Sorsha, it gets to the point where Sorsha basically has to decide whether she's going to kill her mother and she does. Oh yeah. Um, but Con- they do rescue Alora. But now she's like, I've just like, I I I killed my mother. But and so there's a bit of there's a bit of conflict. There's a bit of inner conflict yeah. there. Um, but she becomes queen, and Willow returns to his village. Um, everything's basically made right. Willow returns to his village, and this time, like, he sees his brother has like. His, his not a lot has changed, but he's now he feels like he can actually like confront his brother um, because he's been out being outside the village and he's confronted trolls and monsters and armies and now he feels like he can actually stand up to his brother and he does and he's able to actually like restore order in his village as a result of that. Yay! And that's the end of Willow. Nice. I like you how you run with this whole theme around. Uh, um like the people that you love the most are the hardest to confront. Like, so this whole idea where Sorsha has to come to grips with the fact that she may have to like kill her mother and then does it is sort of like, like she confronts her. And I think it would have been really good if she like gives her the choice. Like you don't have to do this because you have to confront her about it. And then when it, when it's not 
when there's no other way, you sort of have to make the choice. You know, if you're going to continue to yeah, do this, yeah. then. Yeah, that's kind of the way I sort of imagined yeah, it. Yeah, I got that. Mind. I got that. Um, one of the other things, as I was going through that, one of the other things I'd forgotten about to mention when we were talking about the movie was I thought it was sort of strange that they go to this place, Tiras Lean, there's people in Crystal. And they don't do anything? And then there's nothing, yeah, it's like there's, there's, they don't do anything about it. I was sort of, it's funny, I'd seen it before, but this time around, I was trying to remember where it went, and I was like, oh yeah, I think I think they, like, she turns, they, Raziel turns back into a person and she frees all these people from the crystals. That would make sense. And then it no, doesn't it happen. happen. Yeah. They, they just kind of like, they're just kind of left there. And I that, thought, that's why in, wait a minute. in mine, I had at Tiras Lean was like this broken down old castle, mm -hmm. right? Because it had had the, the prosperity stolen out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, then, I like that. And then yeah. when they show up, it's just met Bab Morda in her like, uh, in her army just waiting for them because she knew that the prophecy would be like, bring the child of prophecy to Tiras Lean where she'll prosper. But that's also where... Um, like that's where that's also where um, Sorsha gets turned back into a human, meaning like, and it's the first time she has the scar. So it's like that's where mm -hmm. the child of prophecy appears, right? Because that's where Sorsha gets turned back into a human. Ah, uh, so yeah. The no, I like that. Yeah, the prophecy all happens like as it's going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was that was that was a clever way to 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 put that together. Yeah, the birthmark just happens to be coincidence on Alora. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I also think, uh, just thought, like, instead of having Elora be, like, adopted by Mad Mardigan and Sorsha, like, I was just like, why not have have uh, Willow look after the child? Like, just, like, at the end of the yeah, movie? Yeah, at the end of mean? the movie. Like, I realize that doesn't make sense because then it's like, oh, we did all this stuff just to have Willow go back to where he was. But in my version, it would be like, well, why not? Like, Sorsha's 17. She's not going to take a baby. But, right. but but Willow's already fathered two children. Why wouldn't he? Right, right, right. Yeah, and I guess because that, that's another thing with the movie too. It's like, I guess I guess it does kind of become a self fulfilling prophecy. Like basically, the queen's the queen's attempts to try and kill this baby are effectively what lead people back there to overthrow her. Yeah. The baby really does nothing. The baby is a MacGuffin. Um, like you might as well call her yeah. like. Elora McGuffin instead of Elora Gannon. <laughs> That's what she is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, I suppose at the end, like Willow could go back to his village with Elora, and you know, and Elora grows up with Willow and his family. That I, what I probably would have done is had at the end end of mine, if if Willow does survive or if Sorsha does survive, I would have had her be like, well, uh, I guess she's queen now, and I would have had her like have Willow move to the castle with her. Because she would probably mm -hmm. be friends with him and want his advice. She's only seventeen, right? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He'd become like one of the, one of her advisors, or like the I don't know the the the, the court sorcerer. Yeah, whatever. Doesn't really matter. Yeah, what that he actually is, makes but. sense. That makes sense as an endpoint yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting that yeah, because I I just I I guess I hadn't really thought of that till this point. The whole prophecy. Yeah, the baby. The baby really is has no part in this prophecy. Yeah, never does the baby actually prophecy. show any kind of magic. She just sort of maybe talks mm. to fairies, maybe. Maybe. And, and, yeah. And there's it's hinted that like nobody can resist the baby's charms. Yeah, with, I, I, su I suppose sort, that sort of happens with yeah. Mad Mart again, and I thought that's what they were gonna do with Sorsha. Mm -hmm. But whatever. I don't know. It's dumb. Yeah, yeah. There was definitely there was definitely some things that when you really think about it, you go, yeah, those those threads just don't really connect. Yeah. Any last but, minute? You know, any last minute thoughts about I was Willow? Say, just it's it's still fun. Yeah. You know, it's a it's a fun movie. If you have if you have kids and you need to keep them entertained f for two hours on a Saturday, it's you know you need to plop them in front of something. Yeah. I don't know if you're okay with if you're okay with the you know it's actually some pretty violent scenes. Yeah, man, that that, that scene where they it. get turned into pigs is fucking scary. Yeah. <laughs> and there's some like there are some pr pretty haunting moments too. Like there's a scene where Bev Morta like jumps out at them and she has like her face is oh, all fucky, yeah yeah yeah. There's there's some pretty disturbing images in there too, but. Uh, oh, another thing I forgot to mention. On IMDb, there's a great scene, there's a great interview with Ron Howard where he basically talks about witnessing this orgy that happened on set while they were making Willow. What? 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 
Yes, yeah. I go uh, go look it up. That's all I'm gonna say. Oh, this is, okay. this is, th- I think the video is called Ron Howard like remembers parties on Willow set. Okay, I will look that up. But uh, but it's <laughs> way more. Uh, the the title parties is very misleading. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's uh, not entirely accurate. <laughs> uh, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Nate Draper. I am on Letterbox at Draper Nate, or you can find me on my website at www.nathanieldraper.com. You can always catch more episodes of this podcast right here on this channel, and you can listen to my band Robot Philosopher anywhere you listen to dope music. And don't be uh, shy, or rather, be sure to check out uh, the Cynic Masters Ultimate Timeline, where we do lots of scripted content about movies and entertainment and video games. So we'll uh, check you there. But thanks so much for hanging out with us. Yeah, thanks for listening.